All right, let's talk about uh, measures of variability. Once we've talked about central tendency, this is the natural place to go to. So why do we measure variability? Well, an easy graphic way to look at it is because this distribution, so you can see each of these is one individual. That distribution is not the same as this distribution. However, they both have the same mean. So the mean only tells you part of what you need to know about a distribution of scores. It tells you, I mean, any any index measure like this where you're taking one number to represent a bunch of numbers is not going to tell you everything you need to know about those numbers. So you have to decide what else you need to know. We almost always want to know about variability as well as the center. Sometimes variability is called spread. So you can see that top distribution has more spread. In other words, the scores are more spread out away from the center. The bottom one's more clumped toward the center. So the center just finds where the middle is, and then measures of spread, like standard deviation and variance, they tell you how far away the other scores are from that on average. So how is this useful? Right now it's just useful as a measure of, um, of spread in samples or populations that we're looking at that, that we're not really looking beyond. So it's just a descriptive statistic. It just tells us something about a, a data set or a sample. But later, it's going to be a key component in inferential statistics. So variance, specifically, is a really important chunk of almost all the inferential statistics we're going to use later in this semester. So the first measure of spread we want to look at, or measure of variance, variability, is the range. The range is extremely easy to calculate. The range is just the largest value minus the smallest value. So sometimes people will say the range is, and then they'll list the largest or the smallest and the largest. So the age range was from 2 to 12 years old. But um, more technically correctly, we would say the age range is 10 years. So the range is a single number. It's a difference between two numbers. It's not the values themselves. It's a difference between them. So here's some examples. If you have these lengths in millimeters, the range is 1.7 millimeters, because that's the difference between the largest and the smallest of those numbers. If you have this range, or the, the, this set of numbers, the range is actually almost 700, whatever they are. There's no units, so we don't know what those are. So the interquartile range is a much better measure. It's actually excellent. It, it works in a lot of situations. It's just the width of the box in a box plot, which is Q3, or the third quartile, minus Q1, the first quartile. So much like the median, because it's based on robust statistics, the interquartile range is a robust statistic. Uh, quantiles, in other words, like uh, quartiles, or deciles, or quintiles, or whatever, those are robust. They're robust to um, extreme scores, for instance. So this familiar box plot here, you've got the range Oh, or sorry, the distance, the width of that center section of the box plot, that's the interquartile range. Those are outliers. And the way outliers are usually defined for box plots, by the way, just a little detail, not that you need to know this, is that an outlier is anything that is more than one and a half IQRs away from the median. So this middle vertical line, the box plots can be vertical or horizontal, vertical or horizontal. This middle vertical line is the median, and the IQR is that wide. So if you take one and a half of those, these are the observations that are beyond one and a half IQRs. So the IQR not only tells you how much spread there is, but it becomes, as I've mentioned before with the standard deviation, it becomes a yardstick sometimes for measuring within a distribution. So let's look at this example. The mean of these scores, so each block is one individual. So you can see, for instance, there are 13 people who got 16 on a class exam. And there are two people who got 21, etc. And then all these people, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people got 26. The mean of that of that distribution of scores is 23.1. The median is 24.5. Now, we're not going to go into too much detail about this, but you need to think about the spaces between numbers when you start looking at something that depends on splitting a, a data set. So if you're going to split a data set in half, you're going to have to split between some numbers or even within some numbers sometimes. So here, there are the same number of observations above 24 and a half as there are below 24 and a half. So 25 and above versus 24 and below. Well, the halfway point between 24 and 25 is 24.5 or 24.5. And this appears to be discrete 
data. So these seem to be whole numbers or integers. And so 24.5 is a good place to put that median value because you know no whole numbers are going to wander into that space. Not that you have much choice. You need to put the median where it goes. So the box plot of student exam grades is you have to put the median in Q3 and Q1 right in there. You have to put the minimum and the maximum. Now, if you're doing this by yourself, don't worry about trying to identify outliers. Just do minimum and maximum. So there's a minimum, the maximum, the median, median, and there's Q1 and Q3. There you go. There's a box plot. Sometimes we put in a, a star or a circle or something in the middle of a box plot to indicate where the mean is, because the difference between the mean and the median can tell you things about the distribution of the data, about skew, for instance. So here are our quartiles, Q1, Q2, which is the median, and Q3. They're both 0.5 measures. I actually crafted this data set and made it so that uh, the median and the quartiles didn't actually fall in the middle of a whole number. That works. You just have to use a slightly different procedure for deciding what it is. So the interquartile range is Q3 minus Q1. It's just the difference. So 26.5 minus 19.5. So IQR is 7. 7 is, is a measure of how much spread in the interquartile range. There you go. Sometimes we put an arrow between two um, vertical lines within the distribution to indicate variance or spread of some sort. So the variance and the standard deviation are like the mean, not robust. Like the mean, they have the wonderful property that they are sensitive to all the values in the distribution, but like the mean, they're sensitive to those values, and that sensitivity can cause problems if they're skew or outliers. But they are extremely important and useful. The standard deviation is built like the mean, and it's built from the mean. It's the average difference, or the mean difference, or the mean deviation between any given score and the mean of that score, as we've seen before. So in this case, average deviation or average difference um, could be called standard, and we do that sometimes. Standard is average. It's kind of old-timey stats math language, but it's stuck around in things like standard deviation. So that's why that's a standard deviation. The average difference is the standard deviation. So conceptually, the standard deviation is a me measure of variability. It's more specific than the interquartile range. It's more sensitive to all the scores. So it's great. It's much like a mean. So we start with the mean to calculate the standard deviation. The mean itself is a middle point. So to calculate variability, usually you start with a middle point and measure deviations from that middle point. Not always. There are other ways to do it, but that's the most common way to do it. So what is the average difference, we ask ourselves, of, a, of scores in my distribution from the average of the group? What's the average difference from the average? To what extent do people deviate from average? Or to what extent do scores deviate from average? Anyway, sorry about that little glitch. Um, so we calculate the average deviation of a group of scores from their own average. So the average deviation from average. Deviation of scores is a mathematical thing we do all the time. Usually when we write x, we either mean all the values that mean that are included in x, or we mean any individual x value. Now there are ways mathematically distinguish between those two, but, two, but sometimes context takes care of it. So in this case, a deviation of scores is the score itself minus the mean of the group of scores that score came from, so the mean of the whole group of all the scores. Positive deviations, when you take x minus the mean, not the mean minus x, when you take x minus the mean, positive deviations from the mean will be positive, and negative deviations will be negative. So, first find the mean, second find each score's deviation from the mean, third find the average of those deviations. The problem with that is the average deviation will always be zero. That's one of the properties of the mean. It's the point at which all of the deviations on the low side, like on the left side, cancel out all the deviations on the high side. It's the center of gravity. It's the balance point. So the left side balances the right. So if you make the left side negative and the right side positive, you get zero. So I can look at this example here. Here's a mean of these numbers. 
I think this is the hours spent studying data set here. We can look at all these deviations here. The length of those arrows is the deviation of each score from the mean score. That will always balance. Always, 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 as long as you calculated the mean in the classic standard way. So how do we keep the scores from canceling each other out? We can just make them all positive. Now the easiest way to do that would be to just take the absolute value, and as we've seen, that is one way to do things. You can take the median absolute deviation, which is a really great measure of, of uh, variance, variability, spread. Or we can just square all the deviations, and that makes all the deviations positive also. So that's what we do in classic statistics, because the squared sum of deviations, those squared deviations and then added them together is a big deal, and a lot of our statistics are built on that foundation. That concept is called the sum of squares, the sum of the squared deviations from the mean. Uh, you don't need to know about that yet. It's just a piece of cog in the machine for right now. Just remember, we have a squared deviation. But what we really want is an average squared deviation, or an average something. I don't know why IE average squared deviation is repeated. So the mean of anything is all of those things divided by the number of things that there are, right? If it's a numerical variable. Well, we have a whole bunch of squared deviations. So if we want the average squared deviation or the mean squared deviation, we just divide that by the sample size, divided by n. So the formula for the variance then is sigma x minus x bar quantity squared over n. In other words, you sum up all of the deviations of the scores from the mean, and those are squared first and then summed, and then you take the average of those squared deviations. It's the mean squared deviation from the mean. So that mean squared deviation is known as the variance, and it becomes extremely useful, but squared quantities are weird. It's hard to know exactly what you're dealing with. They're not good quantities, except in the physical world. You have squared quantities that make any sense. But we treat variance as if it were a substance. We ask how much variance there is. We ask, we don't ask if we can borrow a couple of variance. We talk about more variance or less variance. So we still don't have the average deviation. We have the average square deviation. So just unsquare it. Take the square root of the variance, and that's the standard deviation. So one important issue is the issue of notation. So in statistics, we always have some a word or a symbol or an acronym or something that describes every little thing we might calculate. So in this case, we have um, four of them. Standard deviation and variance are essentially interchangeable because all you do is square a standard deviation and you have a variance, or square root of variance and you have a standard deviation. It's like saying Clark Kent and Superman are two different people. They're not. You just put on the glasses, take off the glasses. That's, that's how close standard deviation and variance are. These little symbols here, I'm trying to kind of, with the lines and the dashes, that's me trying to kind of show things there. Um, standard deviation in the population, and when you have a value taken from a population, we call it a parameter. So if you had all the values from a population, and you used the formula for population standard deviation, and you calculated the standard deviation, and then you wrote that down, you would want to say sigma equals uh, that O with a tail, it's actually a lowercase s in Greek, it's a lowercase sigma. So you'd say sigma equals 12.7 or whatever you calculated. If you calculated the variance, it would be like sigma equals 26 point, or sigma squared equals 26.9. So use sigma, a Greek term for the population parameters. For sample statistics, um, the sample standard deviation, we just use the Latin letter s instead of the Greek letter s lowercase s. And then for the variance, we use a lowercase s squared. So you'll see those terms thrown around from time to time. Try and keep in mind that they're kind of interchangeable as long as you remember to square or unsquare as necessary. So look at this right here and try and answer which of these four is, tr is, is the correct term for what that is. Dog height s equals 23.5 centimeters. Oops. The answer is the s is lowercase uh, Latin letter, so that means it's a sample value, and it's not squared, so it's standard deviation. So it says standard deviation of a sample, so that's going to be number two. 
number of F's you received in college. Say you ask a whole bunch of students and your answer, the thing you calculate is sigma squared equals 18.3. The answer there is three, the variance of a population. It's squared, so it's a variance. So the, the symbol says has a squared, so that tells us it's a variance, not a standard deviation. And it's sigma, so that's a population. It's the Greek letter, which means population, not sample. Airplane top speed, say you have a whole bunch of airplanes, and you look at all their different top speeds, and you find that the, the variability of airplane top speeds is 63.2 kilometers per hour. That's number one, standard deviation of a population. The sigma is population. And the fact that it's not squared, there's not a square symbol there, means it's standard deviation, not variance. Gross domestic product, let's say you looked at a whole bunch of states or nations, and you calculated maybe the mean and the standard deviation or whatever, the gross domestic product, and your variance estimate is, or spread estimate is S equals $94.3 billion. That's going to be number two, the standard deviation of a sample. S means it's from a sample, sigma would be population, and it's not squared, so that's standard deviation, not variance. Number of tiles in the residential bathrooms. I'll let you figure this one out. So there are two different formulas for standard deviation. One is divided by n, and the other one has an n minus 1 in the denominator for it. It has to do with whether you're dealing with a well, kind of, with a population or a sample. So assumptions matter even if you don't recognize those assumptions. Now, the book is more complicated than this. It gets more complicated. My rule is a little simpler, taken from other sources. But as soon as you say, I'm dealing with a sample, then you imply that there is a population that that sample came from. And a sample mean is an estimate of the population mean. Anytime you calculate anything from a sample, you have estimated something in the population. So if you're calculating something from the sample, you're estimating something from a population, and therefore, you, therefore you're now reducing the amount of unknown information from the population. This is weird, but this is, this is the logic here. You don't have to know this logic. You just have to memorize which is n and which is n minus 1. So s is an estimate of sigma. So the sample standard deviation is an estimate of the population standard deviation. And so we'll pause here and talk about this basic principle. Any sample statistic is automatically, whether you realize it or not, it's an estimate of a population parameter. A statistic in the, pop, in the sample, some value you calculate from a sample, is automatically an estimate of the corresponding value in the population. It's just the nature of the difference between samples and populations. So the basic rule for n or n minus 1, and the book gets a little more complicated, but I'm not going to really hold your feet to the fire with this at all, but try and remember that this is an issue, is that if you're calculating a population value, then you use the formula that has n in the denominator. But if you're calculating a sample, or, yeah, a sample value, then you use n minus 1. It's a way of punishing yourself by adding back in, by respecting the fact that you have already, or in accommodating the fact that you have already estimated something from the population. And remember, these standard deviation and variance, the formulas use the mean that you estimated at every step. And so it doesn't make sense to estimate a mean and then pretend like the estimate of standard deviation is a purely, totally separate thing. It's related because you use that estimate of the mean to calculate the standard deviation and the variance, right? So n minus one, is recognizing the fact that you've actually already done some estimating before you even start. And so you're accounting for the fact that you've already reduced some of the unknowns in this situation. All right, here's the principle, and we'll stop there for right now.